How many of you here today have had <clears throat> a clear definition in your mind of the kingdom of God? Thought I'd ask you. Okay. And how many of you in your journey in Christ have heard often that phrase, the kingdom of God, sometimes the kingdom of heaven? And I don't think they're two different things uh, when, you, when you start doing the background on those words. Kingdom of God. <clears throat> in America... Um, we don't really understand king rule. We don't have that set up, do we? You have a king that takes you all the way to the main authority in the land. Now, if you're in England, it takes you on a different road, and, you, and there's a certain authority, but it's not the same as having governing authority at all. Uh, but it's interesting. <clears throat> And the Bible reveals very clearly when you're reading Old Testament and the New Testament and paying attention to God at work with his nation from Abraham and uh, the Jews particularly and the tribes that were put together and delivered from Egypt, a people that <clears throat> he wanted to be king of. If you're going to have the kingdom of God, then God's going to be the king that rules it. And the problem with Israel is that they didn't want God to rule it. And when they got farther along in all of their journeying and looking at their life, they wanted someone like every other people had on the earth that they knew about. Flesh and blood. Human being that could be their king. And of course, finally, and I have to say it this way, finally God gave them a flesh and blood king to rule over them, Saul. Now, why would one want to follow a king named Saul? Because he looked like a king. He was the right kind of man to have. They didn't even have television and all that stuff to put him on, you know, so he could be seen of all. But he was tall and I think probably good looking and had a way about him. But he didn't do so hot, did he? Leading God's people. Didn't do so well. And finally, God got Israel to a point to where they got a king that he had chosen for them. Since they were going to have a king, he'd make the choice. He'd have a man come who was after his own heart. A man that we know of early on as a shepherd boy who learned a lot about what God was like keeping watch over his flock by night, I'm sure. Understanding, getting acquainted with this God, he probably spent a lot of time looking up. Look at those stars. Wow. They look small from here, but uh, he began to think about how big God was and this God who takes care of everything. And then he began to think about, I do a pretty good job taking care of these sheep and God's probably doing a pretty good job shepherding me. A lot of thought in David. Read the Psalms, you get a lot of it. At least 75 Psalms and the 150 have been accredited to David. He had this relationship with God that was amazing, but he also was a man who was a warrior. And uh, I'll have to tell you, it was Israel's Camelot time with David. That's the best they were going to do until the Davidic heir came. Until the king that would come from the house of David finally shows up and became their king, that was going to be the best they would ever do. In fact, sometimes after that, their kings were horrible men. Horrible. And they kept rejecting God his way for them, his desire for them, and they finally ended up, you know, just pretty well plastered. The northern kingdom had divided from the southern kingdom, and the northern kingdom was overrun and, and scattered and taken away, and the southern kingdom, Judah, finally heads off to Babylon, taken away, exiled. Now, there would be another exodus out of exile that would bring them back to their land. And they would endeavor to walk with God, but they never did a very good job of it. 
we go all the way to the New Testament, 400 years before we get to the New Testament's beginning, the prophets all are quiet. And there's no word from the Lord for 400 years. Oh yeah, history is going on and various names that we know in historical record are living their lives and fighting their wars and it's going on. And then a prophet, odd prophet showed up. A prophet that Isaiah had prophesied would come a long time before. A prophet shows up. And he's a voice crying in the wilderness, introducing the arrival of a kingdom. King. Messiah. Introducing him. Wearing his odd clothes, eating his odd snacks, introducing a kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is near, he said. Interchangeably, he could have said the kingdom of God is near. And the person he came to introduce finally stepped on the stage of time, the beginning of the New Testament, as the Lamb of God, introduced by this same prophetic voice, Behold, or looky there. Jeff and I like that. That's how I translated the word behold when I was dealing with uh, Greek. It just made sense coming from Texas. It's better. Behold, what is that? Looky there, we understand. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Oh, that was big. Now, when you begin to get the picture when you, when you pause long enough to think about all that's being said about him. A kingdom means a king. A Messiah has come to build that kingdom. And he himself is going to be the lamb that makes possible for sinners to be a part of that kingdom and to worship and follow that king. That's amazing, isn't it? I love thinking about it. The kingdom of God. Let me read you my, to you my two verses for the text. Very familiar, very simple. Mark chapter 1 and verses 14 and 15. Now after John was arrested, this is John the Baptist. You have to understand that in Mark a lot of things happen in a hurry. Quick enough so that you've got all these preliminary events in the first chapter. And we come to the point where John the Baptist was arrested. He's going to his head lopped off, so what's going to happen? When he's arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, this is Jesus' words preaching the same thing, basically, that John preached, but now's the time. It's now the beginning. Now, at the, at the very outset of Mark's gospel, which is the first of the gospels written. In other words, Matthew is not the first written. It's the first in line in, in the canon of Scripture. But the oldest gospel we have, a new genre, this gospel story, this narrative of the life of Jesus and all the things that are in it, told by Mark, might be Peter's story, Mark written, but this is the first of them, and it's, and it's fast moving. A lot of things happen in a short time in the text. So when he starts it off, he begins, as it is written, Mark says, in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's John. He starts baptizing in the wilderness for the forgiveness of sins, in order for Jesus to be introduced to those who were coming. And in those days, Jesus came into the arena, came from Nazareth, of Galilee, was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now, that's how quickly the story moves. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. Oh, that was a confirmation. You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. 
What happens next? Well, in this narrative, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. And when he left there, John being arrested, he decided it was time to really begin to preach. He had defeated the enemy's best shots in the wilderness. Three major blasts at him to get him to somehow leave what he knew his purpose was. Refused to carry out what God had ordained for him when he came. So he begins to preach the kingdom of God is at hand, call for repentance. Then you know what he does along with that? The very next verse says, passing through the Sea of Galilee, alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea. They were fishermen, and he said to them, follow me. I'll make you to become fishers of men. And then he got the sons of Zebedee, James and John, who were fishermen in partnership with the others. And they too left their boat and their father and the hired help and followed Jesus. Four of them right off the bat. Now, if you're going to be the Messiah and you're going to be the king, you've got to have men. You've got to have people in your kingdom. They got to be people that are going to walk with you and submit to you and obey you and be yours. He already begins, when he begins to preach, to call men and ultimately men and women to follow him. He has women that are going to be a part of the entourage as he goes around through the country. He's going to have people following him, a part of what he's teaching and what he's doing. And then in the very next paragraph, he begins his healing ministry. We can say it that way. He begins to heal people of their sicknesses. Now let me remind you that when Jesus showed up in the land around the Jordan, there were all kinds of people with physical ailments or demon-possessed. Have you read the New Testament enough to know that there were often lots of people under demon authority? It was a land where darkness had reigned, where God had been pushed to the side, where 400 years there was no prophet, and just now we're coming back to hear that voice. In America, we're not always sure there are demons because they're cultured. They act nice sometimes. We're looking for someone to throw themselves on the floor and throw up a bunch of stuff that looks like a devil. That doesn't happen very often. Have any, have any of you ever been in a church where you, were, you had somebody show up that just demonstrated that kind of an action, demonic action? You Baptists don't have that happen, do you? Oh, okay. I got you. It happens anywhere they show up. And I'm going to tell you, the first time I got involved with that, I was just a kid preacher. I mean, still a kid preacher, but I was a little kid preacher then. I was pastoring my home church. I was 20 four maybe, something like that, 25. And I went to a house because a wife had called me and said her husband was having a fit or something. And I went there, and uh, the encounter with that person, I knew him well, knew the family. I pastored them for a while. I never saw anything like it up to that point. Let me just say, I didn't stay long. I, uh, I did my authoritative prayer thing, and he's swinging at me and trying to hit me and doing the snake business with the tongue fa moving faster in and out of his mouth than I could ever. It could not happen without some kind of supernatural power at work. There was no way I could do that by myself. I got smarter later. Took people with me. But you know who's greater than that kind of authority? Jesus is. And when he came into the land were all these who were his people, we might say, part of Israel, part of Abraham's seed, part of the people that lived there in that part of the world, demon powers everywhere. If he encountered one, it was time to deliver, he delivered. And he delivered many, according to what I read in the New Testament. What was happening? He was bringing into the nation that God was working to redeem. He brought into it 
and authority that is associated with the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God and His authority, in the age that was to come, we might say, the age that was coming is the age that was ushered in with the coming of the Messiah, the beginning of it. The authority in that new age or in that new time was an authority that could deliver the blind from his blindness, the deaf from his deafness, the lame from his lameness, the demon possessed from his possession. It was the glorious power of the God of the kingdom revealed in the Messiah of the kingdom who one day would be declared to be Lord of lords and what? King of kings. When he began to do miraculous things, he got all kinds of feedback. A lot of the authorities around there among the Jews just didn't like it. He disturbed everything. It shook up the status quo. They were not so concerned about people being freed from demons. They were concerned about the operation, the structure of their religious practices. And the Pharisees who lived supposedly the best ethical life among the peoples of that place really didn't like all this disturbance, changing people like that, delivering them, creating havoc, attracting crowds, all kinds of problems. The kingdom of God with the coming of the Messiah became a present fact in the world. The kingdom had come. Now listen to me, you know what I'm going to say next. The kingdom is here, but the kingdom is coming. Now there's a tension in that if you're living in the world and you're a part of it. Isn't that right? Wouldn't there be a pretty big tension? Man, I'm a part of the. I'm following the King. Jesus is my Lord. I'm following Him. He delivers His people. What an amazing thing. And then all of a sudden you're in a warfare or something's going on in your life that's not changing and not getting better, and you find yourself grappling with where is the King? Why doesn't He heal me? Why doesn't He do it for everybody? Now listen, saints, we just as well think about this properly because I've heard this debated so many times. You know, if, if we just had faith, God heal everybody. Well, let me know when you get it. I'll slide in with you. Because, I mean, there are some pretty, pretty big deals going on in the name of Jesus, but we don't have to charge over that. And the kingdom is... If the kingdom were fully here and all the authorities were in place, we'd call it glorious, which is where we're headed. In a glorious kingdom, no more what? No more sickness, no more death, no more crying, no more of any of that. But see, as long as we live in this physical state and we're not home yet and Jesus hasn't finished the coming of the kingdom yet, there are going to be times when it looks like God is just doing marvelous things. There are going to be other times when it looks like nothing is happening, and we have to trust Him and walk with Him no matter what, because that is how faith is going to have to work. We're going to have to keep believing Him, whether He does what I want Him to or not. Because last time I looked, um, He hadn't given me the authority to decide what He should do. Just trust Him and keep walking, keep sharing. The kingdom of God, in a real sense, with the coming of Jesus to the earth, became present in the world. Anybody see it? Oh, they only saw it when they saw that power beyond natural power ability. They only saw it when they saw something happen that had no explanation in this life. 
when it took God to do it. And then all of a sudden you recognize He's the Messiah. He's the one. When you read the Old Testament, what I find is there's a lot of references, different ways of saying it, future tense statements like, Behold, the days are coming. Look at there, the days are coming. When this is going to happen and that's going to happen. But in here in the New Testament, when we come to the kingdom of God, what we get is not it's coming. We got that at the beginning, but when Jesus showed up, what we get, the kingdom of God is here. Present tense, as contrasted with that other tense in Hebrew in the Old Testament, which is like future. It isn't exactly future, but it does refer to things like that. It does deal with what's coming. I got different names for some of that. And I didn't search it out. I have to search it out every time people will say it. So I didn't do that this time. But the messianic age dawned with the coming of Jesus, with the coming of John the Baptist to introduce him. The affirmation was there. The messianic age had dawned. And he who is greater than Solomon and greater than Jonah, and those are the two references used in the New Testament early on, to declare who this guy is who's come. He's greater than Solomon, that's the king, greater than Jonah, that's the prophet, and he's greater than both of them. And he even went on in Matthew 12 to say he is greater, this one here is greater than the temple and the law. And he's talking about the Sabbath in that setting. Because Jesus kind of did things on the Sabbath that was unacceptable. And Jesus wasn't subject to the Sabbath. He was one greater than the day. He was the Messiah. There were not these limits there. Now, here's the other thing we have to remember about Jesus when He first comes. Isaiah spent a lot of time communicating the truth about a suffering servant as a Messiah. You read Isaiah? Read Isaiah, and he talks about a servant. He talks about how the folk are going to be treated by that servant, how they need to react to that servant. It's all in, in Isaiah. But most Jews, even leadership among them, weren't looking for a suffering Messiah. They missed that altogether. They weren't looking for a servant. Now, when we live in this world how we live right now, and we're following Jesus who is the servant, what are we going to be like? How are we going to live? Are we going to be servants too? Yeah, because we're going to be like Him. So our purpose here is to, Jesus said His purpose was to seek and save the lost. He came to serve, not to be served. So our position here, though we know God is going to bless us and continues to bless us, what we need God is going to give us, but our living is always as one who serves. Maybe we should carry a basin and a towel with us, remind ourselves that we have a task to do with people. And when the servant is on the scene and his works are being seen, and John the Baptist, when he, when he couldn't hear about Jesus overthrowing Rome and doing all the things he thought he was going to do when he first got there, he said a message to him with a messenger. Are you the one? Or should we look for another? Why would John the Baptist do that? He'd already introduced him as the one. And he's in jail now, of course. That puts things kind of down in a deeper hole. Why would he do that? Because he had, he had hooked in to that idea that when the Messiah comes, he's going to deliver the Jews from their captives. That is, they're going to be delivered from Rome's authority over them. And the Messiah is going to defeat Rome on their behalf. They thought that's what their Messiah was going to do. And so John is saying, I don't hear anything about a war. I don't hear anything about an overthrow. And here's um, what he said.
Go and tell John, Jesus said, what you hear and see. Here's what it is. Now there's stuff going on, but here's what you tell John. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. Hey, I thought we were going to take care of Rome. No, we're going to take care of you. Every single individual who can hear what Jesus is sending back to John will recognize this whole thing for me and you starts with a transformation on the inside. The good news being preached to us. Go and tell him. Good news preached to them. And then he said, Blessed is the one who's not offended by me. John, don't be offended that I haven't overthrown the Caesars yet. Don't be offended that that hasn't happened. The truth of the matter is, what will never happen is the local church or the church that is in Jesus Christ getting together, having a meeting, and deciding we're going to take the world, knock down every authority, and be the authority. That is not a suggested plan. There is not one place in the New Testament where it tells us that the church is going to be able to overthrow the authorities. Not even instructed to. Did you hear what we read earlier today? What the instruction of Peter was for the leadership? Let it be a blessing to you. You know, sometimes it's not. Honor those in authority. Recognize they're there by God's design. That's hard for me. How about you? Yes, well, get used to it. God has always been in charge of putting people in place when He wanted someone in place for His will to be done in something. And we don't always know what that is. But the works that has been done by the Messiah will be seen by all. They're out in the open. And they're demonstrating the power of that kingdom, that divine power of the kingdom that is just beginning to break out. This is the day which all those people in the past longed to see. Luke wrote, chapter 10. But they didn't see it. Now he said, Jesus did, but you've seen it to those around him. Because the time is fulfilled. So the kingdom is here in Jesus among men. It can be said within. I think the better translation is among because it's in Him this Holy Spirit has full authority and power. And He, as the seed that is planted to bring forth the crop, is the one who had the kingdom within. He, among them, was the King. In the person and work of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God has intruded into our world. And those miraculous, supernatural things that happen were designed to make people interested in just what kind of kingdom this might be. It was integral, that kind of work, to, to the person of Jesus. That's who He was, the Messiah. God, come as man. He wasn't just a man. I think every once in a while we have to rethink who we think Jesus is. He's God. That's, that's one thing that we know for sure. He was born of a virgin that was conceived in the womb of a virgin. God made a body for him in the context of a developing body in a woman's body, just like everybody else. A body you have given me, he said to God. 
You've prepared for me a body. What did you need the body for? To be a man walking the earth. We're not disembodied spirits. Men and women have human flesh. We know each other not by what your heart looks like unless you're a doctor looking at it right now. We know each other by how we look, how we act, who we are. Now, we see each other change, of course, through the years. and Sometimes keeping up with it's a challenge, isn't it? <laughs> we move on. We get older. Droops happen. Creases, slower steps, all that. But he was a man, living as a man, but not just here to fully give himself up as a man. He was here as God's Son become flesh and dwelt among us in order that he might redeem us. And he was willing to do that. The power of of the kingdom of God was present in the working of those miraculous healings as God intended to reveal the nature of the kingdom come who was yet to come. Show the power of it. Jesus refused to perform signs for the benefit of those he was endeavoring to reach. You seen that in the New Testament? Whereas he comes wants a sign. You say, not going to get one. Not going to give you a sign. It wouldn't help. You wouldn't get it. But they wanted signs. They wanted something to affirm that that power is really the Messiah. That that action right there is legitimately God at work among us. Show me a sign. Remember the man who was in his place of departure and he was concerned about his family. He wanted, he wanted them to be sent something so they'd be convinced that they needed to prepare before they died to come where he was. Send them, show them a sign, show them something, give them. He said, they've got the Scriptures. They have the revelation that's in the Word of God. If we took them any number of signs, they wouldn't believe it. If they don't believe the Scripture, they won't believe the sign. Basically what he said. False messiahs are the one who show off with signs and wonders. That's why we have to always have some sense about us spiritually when we start dealing with what's happening in our culture or what's happening in the name of the church or in the name of preaching or whatever else we do. Power sometimes is a real wreck of a power, not from God at all, but a very false bit of action. The miracles were mighty works. They were powers. They were dunamis. A taste of the powers to come is what they were, a real Because so many people were in the grip of the adversary, Jesus healed a lot at times, cast out a lot of devils. But the kingdom had broken into the world, and Satan will meet his match. You know, the victory in Jesus caused this response, our Lord noting, I beheld Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Now you guys are looking at what's going on here and you're excited about somebody hearing your message because they just sent these fellows out on a little evangelistic trip through the neighborhoods. And they came back and talked about what was subject to them. Devils are subject to them. Man, it's just wonderful. He said, ah, I beheld Satan fall from heaven like lightning. You didn't see that, did you? No. Well, he's, that's because he's the one doing, he's been defeated by the one that's done it. And uh, they were just puttering along trying to figure it out. 
He said, listen, don't rejoice that devils are subject to you. Don't rejoice because you've got power to produce a miracle of some kind or a deliverance of some kind. Rejoice in this, that your name is written in heaven. Rejoice that you have been made new, that you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, that you belong to the God of glory, that you're His and He knows you. And you know Him. The kingdom that has come is cosmic. And the end struggle is still ahead. We're not done yet. The angels haven't come to separate the weeds from the wheat. The end hasn't come with its collecting of those who are in Christ. It isn't at all finished yet. But the devil has been declared done. He's been overcome and defeated by Jesus. The one man that he couldn't stop died without having sinned and died in the place of those who had sinned and were under the penalty of death. And when he did it, he just finished out the whole sacrifice system of the Hebrews. The Lamb of God had stepped in. No more lambs, no more bloody messes, no more of that at all. Now we have the Lamb of God who's taken away the sin of the world. This kingdom, ladies and gentlemen, is unstoppable. It is unstoppable. We are concerned about our nation, our country, and it has changed a great deal in my lifetime. In your 70 years, a lot of changes. I loved the simplicity of my growing up days because they were without fear. Nobody locked their doors. In fact, my folks didn't even shut them. They had a screen door, and that's what you shut. The rest of it, People came to the house. We were gone. They could come in, leave something if they wanted to. Nobody ever broke into our house. Nobody ever tried to steal anything. We were out in the country on a farm, and it was, it was beyond any fear. I had none. Went all over the woods, all over the neighborhoods, rode bike all over those highways out there around Decker Prairie, and never worried about it. Nobody stopped to talk me into getting in the car. You get a little cotton-top kid, four or five years old, three years old, walking around out in your front yard. Now somebody might try to take off with them. It's the fear that runs so hard in our lives because our world is in such a hard and difficult mess. The kingdom is unstoppable. And when the king has finished, he will be on the throne in glory and every authority of any kind in the world will have been subdued. will be under His authority. We can't live full of fear. We can't be afraid all the time. We have to just make this thing open to God and say, Lord, whatever you want to do with me, I want you to do it. Whatever. And I know because your kingdom is unstoppable, it's going to be an amazing journey. You remember the parables. We've talked about some of the kingdom parables in the light of this series. Um, the kingdom is unstoppable, although it's small in its beginning, like a little bit of yeast thrown in the dough. That's like the kingdom. It's a mustard seed, one of the smaller seeds that's thrown into the ground Look around in a while and you've got a tree. Or it's that growing seed we talked about the other day. When you cast that seed on the ground, you set in motion something that's going to produce a kingdom. When all the seeds are gathered in, all the members and parts of it. In this small beginning, there is hidden an unstoppable victory. So the next time you read the New Testament and you're following Jesus through a gospel, just remember who He is, the King. 
and the kingdom he identifies with has the authority to do whatever needs to be done as he walks to whoever or with whoever he needs to do it to or with. But he's just going to do the Father's will. What he's going to do always is the Father's will. So he's not out there doing what he thinks ought to be done. He's doing what the Father wants done every day. His meat, his food, his sustenance was to do the will of the Father, he said. That's it. Doing the will of the Father in an unstoppable kingdom. Though he couldn't understand, we couldn't understand all of that at all as we just look at it from a distance. So what Jesus is going to do, and I'm going to close, what Jesus does while he's here, in the light of the kingdom come and not yet here but coming, what Jesus does is set out to call people into his kingdom, building his called out ones in the world as his church. Now, a visible church, let's say, where everybody leaves at the same time, walks out front, and you take a picture and see everybody there. The visible church is not the kingdom. Because the visible church is often made up of people who don't know Jesus. I'm talking about it as we know it now. We can't look at a congregation of several hundred and say, well, might be one or two in there that are not in the kingdom. You can't say that. We don't know. Nor can we say that all those people are the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God in which we are a part means that we hold to the king and submit to his authority. Because this king... This king has the authority over us. To be his is to obey him. To walk with him in obedience is to know his touch and the reality of his grace and the wonder of his provision and the assurance that he's not going anywhere. Be about the master's business. Don't go looking for something. Just be ready when He shows you. You don't need a title to do this stuff. You're just walking with Jesus here. In that kingdom that we're part of, the power is able, His power is able to deliver whatever and whoever. Call Him Lord. Follow Him as King. Love Him as Savior. Let Him love you back. He's already loved you. We're just responding to His love. The kingdom of God is here. The good news is, though, the kingdom of God is coming. One of these days, in the glory, all this stuff that we have to deal with in the tension of living in the in-between, when it's here but not all here, not completely here. When we live in that, there are questions and there are things we get frustrated with, there are things we'd like to change. Just keep walking, keep loving. Because when we get home, that dichotomy won't be there. We'll know as we're known. We'll be with the lover of our souls. We'll be with the Father to whom we belong. We'll be fully in the flow of His Spirit without any kind of pain or struggle. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, Your Word is amazing. Your presence, absolutely, incredibly rich. And it's a joy sometimes just to be in your presence, just to sit down and there you are. I'm thankful for that. Father, there's so much about this subject of the kingdom, your rule, 
now and when it's fully done. I don't have answers to. I don't know how to explain. I don't know how to make it explainable. Maybe we don't need to have it explainable. Maybe we just need to submit to the God who called us and walk with him. Help us to do that, Lord. Show us your glory in this journey. Be glorified in your people. Be exalted, O Lord, among your people. We thank you for that. Give us this week the grace to walk where we have to walk and the assurance that when we walk there, you will be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.